before we start, um, I want to want to say that uh, we like to have interaction. I, I don't really like to have to just you know give a lecture and you all go to sleep. That doesn't really help us much. So we like interaction. If you have uh, a verse, because we're also anything you want to bring up between Genesis and Revelation, it's all all good stuff, all legal to use, right? So. Um, if you got something you want to throw out there for us in our discussion that has to do with reading a verse, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get get a mic to you so when you read it, they can get it down on tape. Also, if you have um, a question or a comment that's fairly lengthy, you know, two or three sentences, also would like to get you on mic. If it's quick and I can just repeat what you said back, that, that, that'll that work. Uh, just remind me, you might have to remind me a couple times to repeat it. <clears throat> but anyway, so if it's, if we want to try to at least get it on tape, so that when others are watching it, they're not just hearing my comments, but they're hearing the, the questions and the comments as well, okay? Um, let's see, what else should we say real quick? Pleasure to be here again. I had a wonderful time last time I was down here. You all were very warm and had lots of activity, as I remember. There was a big uh, tent out here, and you had lots of people here, lots of visitors, and so that was fun. But I, I was, as I was talking to Jonathan, I thought, yeah, but it's also fun to come and just have a smaller group, right? Because then we can actually dig better together. If it's too big of a group, <clears throat> then we have to sort of rush through a bunch of ideas and we don't get to dig. So hopefully you're, you're uh, interested in that idea of bringing up comments, questions as we go along. Feel free to challenge something. We're here to really drink in the Word of God, to drink in what we can learn from Jesus, right? Uh, not to make up our, our own program or or to just go with human philosophy. Certainly don't want my philosophy, right? Uh, what we want is, is what God has to say. So that's our sort of ground rules, if you will. Uh, and, and because of that, all questions are, are, are helpful and useful. Um, <clears throat> now some of you, how many of you were at men's retreat? Just, I, I know there's at least a couple here. Okay, all right. So, so tonight, at least until we get this part done, you don't get to add any comments, all right? Because they had a preview. Didn't we do a little bit of this there? Yeah, had a little preview. So what I want to do tonight, <clears throat> as we start our discussion, is, is to ask for, I think, with this size of group, we better go with about six volunteers. Who, who would volunteer to help me out right from the get-go? Okay, Char and Charlie's already seen this. He can't do this. Because uh, <clears throat> we're going to work on this spiritual fitness chart up here. Uh, it's called the spiritual fitness chart. We're going to get some, some idea of wh where we're at. So who would be brave enough to help me out? Do I have six? Okay, two right there. If you just stand up right where you are. I need uh, four more. A anyone else? I'm going to have to pick people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on. Who's brave? You, you, you know I, I ask hard questions, but we're not too hard on you. Rich is going to help us in the back. Do, you don't remember this from the men's retreat? Okay, okay. Uh, how about anybody else? Jonathan will help. He's not, and and Karen, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Good. Okay, so Karen, if you'd stand up. Now, what I want you to do is look at my little chart that we have up here. And up for way in the back, it says perfect, very good, good, okay, not good, bad, very bad, terrible, hopeless. It's really getting bad news down here. Okay. So what I want you to think about, those of you who are volunteering for me, and I want you to be honest, this isn't where you were last week in your spiritual fitness. This isn't where you're going to be tomorrow. This is just today. Where are you at? How do you see yourself? When you evaluate yourself, how is your spiritual fitness doing on that chart? And I'm going to take a pen. We're not going to use any names on the board, <clears throat> but I'm going to take a pen, and I'm just going to mark where you tell me you are, our brave volunteers. Where would you place yourself? Honestly? Yeah. Okay and, okay and good. Okay, so we got one here. Um, good. good. Okay. And uh, right up front here. Good. Okay, we've got, got a group going there. Uh, right in the middle, bad. bad. Oh. There's a brave soul. Okay. <laughs> Way in the back. Okay, and not good. Okay, so we got kind of a loner out here in the middle. And one more, where'd they go? Did we not get six volunteers? Maybe I only had five. Do I have one more brave one, now that you know what the question is? Okay, where you put yourself? That's a tricky word, but I'll say perfect. Perfect. Whoo, okay. Nobody throw any rocks now. 
Okay. Now, that was the first question. We only have three questions for you. That was the first one. That was the least important of our questions for our chart. Second question, a little more important. No matter where you are right now on our chart, where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? And we're going to start again right over here. <clears throat> right up here. Okay, so you're joining the other fella. Here? Okay. And you're going to stay right there. Okay. Because we, we'd let you move if you want. Okay. <laughs> Where? Okay. All right. Jonathan? Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's smiling because he knows that's dangerous, right? Okay, we got five over there. You're going to go way down here? Yeah. How far? I'm going to go all the way. All the way. Okay, third question. This is the most important question. Not where are you and not where do you think you want to go, but are you sure that the direction you chose is the direction that you should go? Are you sure? I mean, in case you want to change your mind, go ahead and evaluate. You want to stay there? You want to change? I'm not sure where you're going. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Help us find that trap so door. Curtain number three. Um, I, I, so if I'm talking about in the eyes of God, okay. seeking God is the far left, and I happen to study with John. <laughs> so John's on the far right. There's a method to his madness. Okay. <laughs> so you're gonna you're gonna go that way. So no, I I still think that I want to. What is the essence of my life? I want to seek to try and perfectly honor God in all I do. Which is excellent, right? I mean, we know that the message that needs to go to the world is to see the revelation of what? Character of God, right? To see, see his perfection worked out in us. We, we don't want to throw that out, right? He's right, there's a trapdoor question. Anybody else have a thought about what? You notice that most, as he just said, are, are wanting to go in this direction, right? Jonathan, right, he's going to try a whole different program. That's because he knows me too well. You guys can sit down. Um, the trap door, as he calls it. it. This is just to get our thoughts going, right? Because it's amazing when you, when you look at this concept about righteousness, righteousness by faith, faith uh, the righteousness of Christ, uh, Christ our righteousness, and my goodness, we, we have so many chopped up theories and variations about all those lines, we get dizzy. So tonight, we're just going to take a look in the Bible a little bit. Now, remember, as I'm doing this, feel free to raise your hand, throw in a verse or a story or a question. But I want to start us off with <clears throat> Moses. Remember Moses? I mean, Moses, an amazing childhood. He's saved in a basket on the river, right? God's hand protecting over that. He's raised where? Pharaoh's house, right? He's trained in, in the program of things. He's trained in the way of, of how it should be done. He's trained in the art of war, trained in generalship, uh, uh, art of war, right? The talents and skills of war, also rulership, maybe wisdom, as they so called it. But when he was 40 years old, because as a child he was taught that he was supposed to rescue his people, right, from their slavery, I mean, at 40, you've got to be saying, well, how, how long are we going to wait, right? So he goes out to see how things are going and see if maybe we could get a revolution going, is what was in his mind. <clears throat> and he saw uh, the slave uh, guy with the whip, the slave driver, right, beating one of his own relatives. And in, in, in one moment, he goes from being prince to what? Outlaw. Criminal. Outlaw, as far as Egypt is concerned, right? So he runs to the desert and, and he ends up over there in Midian and now he's 80 years old <clears throat> been doing something with taking care of sheep and things right for 40 more years now double his age and at 80 years old God says Moses at the burning bush right Moses I want you to go and I want you to rescue my people right what does Moses say <laughs> I'm not the right guy 
I, I have lost the ability to speak. I, I forgot. I don't even know what the new strategies of war are. I only got maybe 30 years of that training, 35, and now they've had 40 more, right? This is the kind of things that might have been going through his mind. But the point is, is that Moses now recognized what? Inadequacy. His inadequacy. He wasn't understanding how that was important in the formula yet, but he was expressing to God, I am not able. And God says back to him, this is a paraphrased version, right? God said back to him, good answer. You've learned well. You've learned your, that's what you didn't know when you were 40 years old. You thought you were ready to go, right? Yeah. And now, now Moses understands something he didn't understand at 40, and God says to him, good answer. Now, here, here comes the big part. God says, trust in what? My power, my abilities, and go to Egypt with all my power and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. That, that's amazing when you just stop to think about that, right? It's like God shows up at your house for breakfast tomorrow morning, and he says, listen, Roberto, right? With all my power that I have to give, with all my power I imbue to you. Now go and help my people. That's literally what he said. And what's Moses' response? Lord, I'm not the right guy. Now, a moment ago, that was the right answer. And now what is it? Wrong. Wrong answer. Wrong answer because the right answer was when he thought it was about him. It, the, you know, I'm not the right guy is the right answer. But now God changed the story. With my power, go and accomplish. Right? Go and do. Take, take to Pharaoh the news. He's got to let my people go. And now Moses says, yeah, but it's just not possible. You hear people saying that today? It's not possible to overcome sin. We have tried, have we not? We have worked at it. We have tried. We've read the verses. We work at trying to get better and better at it. And yet somehow we fell into this trap called, if at first you don't succeed, see, you went to the school of Pharaoh too. <laughs> that is how we're trained. We're trained, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And God's saying, are you, are you going to get it figured out yet? Peter? Right? That's what happened to Peter, too. Another amazing story. Because Peter, uh, if you want to look this one up in Scripture, somebody, there, it's in every, every one of the Gospels, actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start looking. Find it. Pick one of those books. I want you to sort of read what you see in there. Peter, amazing story. Because he's been a disciple for three and a half years now. And, and he's really, you know, he knows how to say it, right? Lord, where would we go? You have the words. Of eternal life uh, Jesus said to him man humanity did not show that to you right he, he 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 recognized to Peter meaning he brought it to Peter's recognition that what just came through his mouth was what the Almighty God who spoke those words that's something has anybody ever told you man what just came through your mouth that was God talking that'd be interesting but somebody uh, you see anything there about Peter and what's going on uh, someone's got it from, anybody got it from Matthew? Anybody found it in Mark? What do you got? Story about Peter. Jesus is saying to him, Peter, you're going to what? Deny me tonight, right? This night. And what's Peter's response is what we're looking for. Somebody got it from Matthew? Luke? Okay, what does it say in Luke? It says, uh, now I lost it. Hang on. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another conf confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Oh, and okay, wait, back up in the story. We want the part where Jesus first tells him, oh, okay. you're going to deny me. And what does Peter say? No, no. 20, oh, 22. There you go. Okay, we're in what, Luke? What, what, what book are you in? Luke. Luke, okay, so find it in the next, a different book. Okay, we'll come there in just a second. You got it? What does it say? Haven't found it yet? Someone help her out. Luke what? 33, but heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's not what Peter No, no, it's not it yet. Let's try it from what you got? Mark. Mark, here's, here's in Mark. What does Peter say to Jesus? No, Peter insisted, not even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. 
Okay, insisted. Anybody else got the same verse in front of a different version? What? Oh, you got Matthew, but what? Uh, yours is in Mark. Anybody else got Mark? Mark what? Uh, it's Mark uh, 14, verse 30. 14, verse 30. Some different version. Ins insisted is in yours? Yeah. What else? Did anybody else's version say it differently? 31. Who's got it? Edie? Luke uh, 22, 33 says, But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Okay, so he's ready to go to prison and death. He's certainly not going to deny Christ. Uh, in Mark, anybody else got the one in Mark? Looking for a, another word. I can give it to you, but I just want you to find it. He sa it says, Peter said to him, Okay, so, so he's still insisting the same thing. I guess uh, the word I'm looking for is vehemently. Which one is that in? Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke? It's in Mark, right? Am amplified. You got, you got Mark from Amplified? Yeah. Okay, what does it say in there? But Peter said more vehemently and repeatedly, even if, I should, if it should be necessary for me to die with you, I will not deny or disown you. What does this mean, more vehemently? King James says that too, right? Vehemently? With passion, like, like, like insisting, like, um, you know, it's almost like he can't believe Jesus is doubting this, right? That's Peter. And, and, of course, we know the story. You know where I'm going with this. But it's amazing to analyze this. What was Peter's problem? Self. self, trust in self, right? He was going to work based on the power that he had, right? Got his sword strapped up, right? Ready to go, going to go to battle. In Desire of Ages, it says that when Peter said that he would not deny his Lord, he meant it. He meant it. He was actually sincere uh, about what he said. He wasn't lying, as far as he knew, but there was a problem. Uh, hand up in the back. Well, just, just another little point. He was at the There's another point here, and that is the fact he was in a group of people. Okay, Peter was. And being in a group of people, and Jesus said, you're going to do this, it puts him on the spot. <laughs> okay, he's got good. a reputation to uphold, too. I mean, he's, I'm sure, sh he, clear, yeah, he was, he meant it when he said it, but he also had other people watching, and we know that from his other experiences that he liked to kind of be the first person to kind of respond to things. So it's, there's, there's a piece of that, too. In there. Of course. So he, he's kind of feeling under pressure. He's got the group watching, and he can't, you know, be looking bad in front of the group. That's all part of it. But his biggest problem at the root of that is he trusts in self. Now, this is the same problem that he had when we're out here in the boat, right? And the Lord says, well, come to me. Walk on the water, right? Peter says, can I come, Lord? If it's you, tell me. And so Peter gets up, and he's he, walking on water. How is that possible? power of God, but as soon as Peter turns to say to his friends, what? Yeah, look at me. Look how I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm further up on this scale over here, right? I know it's a trap door, but <laughs> we're going to use it to make the point. Uh, that's what Peter was doing, and instantly, where does he go? Down in the water. Now, now the Lord, I love this part because the Lord, he knows Peter. He knew Peter's heart. He knew what was going to happen in, in a few months, about a year or so. And he's going to end up in this crazy scenario with all the soldiers around and all the other disciples looking on and watching. And he is going to deny his Lord three times. God knows that. Jesus knew that long before. But Jesus says, well, let's, let's do a little rehearsal. Maybe we can help Peter get it. And so Peter goes down in the water. And, and you notice Peter's next response. It's great what he does. Save me, lest I perish. Well, now, this is a fisherman. He grew up on that lake. It's kind of like, you know, we watch these shows maybe about Alaska fishermen. I mean, they're tough, right? And, and, and here's Peter, he, and he's worried that he's going to drown. I don't know how he went from, like, heavy fisherman, hefty fisherman, to suddenly he's scared that he's going to die, but that's what he's doing. The storm apparently so big or whatever that he's saying, Lord, save me, lest I die. That was the perfect response. That was exactly what God wanted to hear. He wanted to hear, hear Peter say, I need you. That's it. That's all. And what does God do? 
reaches down his hand, smiling at Peter, right? I see it. And, and he's lifting Peter, and there he goes, right back on top of the water. I mean, that's not even humanly possible, right? It's not possible to overcome sin. Neither is walking on water. But Peter did it because it wasn't based in his power. It was based in the power of God. But, but nonetheless, Peter goes through that little scenario, and he totally forgot come, come night before the crucifixion, right? Lord, I will not deny you. Even if everybody leaves you, I will fight and stay to the death. And Jesus, you know, looking at Peter, poor Peter, you still don't, still don't get it. Jesus knew that. That's an amazing love of God, forgiveness of God, who is knowing what Peter's about. I mean, I, wouldn't we want to hit the guy before? <laughs> right? We'd want to, you know, Peter, you just need to check out of the club because you're not going to represent me very well. That's how we do. Right? You, you, don't, you don't make a good member around here. You, you ought to... Just go over there. We don't say that, do we, to people? Because, see, we're, we're too worried about who? Me. Too worried about how you make me look. Too worried about oh, how, what you do to me. But not Jesus. Jesus is ready to turn the other cheek, right? To not resist him who is evil. To let Peter do what Peter's going to do because Peter needs it. This is another amazing part to me about this story. God knew that if Peter didn't go through this, if he didn't do this, he wasn't going to learn. And what was it Peter needed to learn again? Stop trusting self. Stop trusting. That's what Peter needed to learn. And it was effective, right? Because Peter denies his Lord. And, and, and you can almost just hear that rooster crow and the heart panics, right? Because all of a sudden it realizes what it has just done. And, and he turns and he looks at his Lord and what do you think he saw in Jesus' face? Peter, I, I told you. You didn't listen to me. Is that what he saw? No. Not any condemnation. Not any criticalness whatsoever. Wouldn't it be amazing to, to, to join a group of people? You can call it a church if you want. And, and there's no criticalness? And no judgmentalness, and no lording it over, right? I mean, th this is what God wants to do in your heart and mine. Because that's what he was trying to work out in Peter. But Peter, remember before, for three and a half years, the disciples' favorite discussion was what? Who's in charge? Uh, who's first? Who's second, right? Where's my, where's my throne, right? That was always their favorite topic. Even the night before... When they're having supper in the upper room there with him, and he washes their feet after he gives them the, the bread and the wine or the grape juice there, it doesn't take but a few minutes, and they're already back to having that, well, who's first? Who's going to be first in the kingdom? Because the Lord's going to take over in a day or two, and, and I want to be first, right? It's amazing to me to read that right there, that they were doing that still the night before the crucifixion. But again, this is about God who knows them and who loves them and is bringing them around to learn something. They've got to get off of the training of Pharaoh. They've got to get off of their Egyptian thinking, right? The trust in self program. Remember those words we read about the little horn and the Antichrist? <clears throat> and it talks about how he will set himself above what? The Most High? Uh, showing himself that he is God, sitting in the place of God. We read those words, and we usually think about one guy. We're not going to talk about him tonight, because this was about Peter. Peter was doing that. Peter had that little horn suddenly growing up inside, and he was saying, I will, right, achieve. I will do. I will, I will conquer. I will accomplish. And when it came right down to it, what's the best he could do? Deny his Lord three times. And you imagine Peter coming out of that story now, and he sees in the, the face of Jesus that same compassionate, kind, gracious, forgiving love of God, who says, Peter, I'm just here to rescue you from what? What's in you, yourself. Rescue you from you, right? Peter finally realized what he was, and he runs to the garden where, you know, the story prays all night, right? Tears. That's that mourning thing that's talked about in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, right? So Peter did that. He went through that. But, you know, we come back to the story, and, 
Peter's hiding in an upper room because <clears throat> the, Jesus is dead now. And even when they say that he's back, Peter's not too sure. He's hoping, not too sure. And then Jesus, uh, Jesus shows up in, in the room, right there among them. And, and do you see Peter running to his Lord and falling at his feet and saying, I'm so sorry. That's not in the story. In fact, we're not even sure where Peter is and what he's doing. Maybe he's sort of just kind of staying back because last time I put myself out front, what happened? <laughs> he's learned. Maybe I ought to just be kind of quiet over here. Right? And then you, you see some days go by and some more of the story. But then comes that moment when Peter is now sitting around a fire on the beach. And Jesus has cooked them some food. Right? Discussion going on. You don't hear Peter talking. You don't hear Peter, you know, trumpeting. <laughs> yes, you're back, Lord, and we're going to take over. It's none of that. He's concerned. Because now he knows what's in him. Now he knows. Without the power and the love and the grace of God living in him, he will only accomplish sinfulness, unrighteousness, lord it overness. He'll only accomplish, Lord, thank you that I'm not like that guy over there. But all of a sudden now Peter knows he is that guy. And so he's quiet. But the Lord, seeing that he's still sort of uh, needing some now come out of that where you used to depend on self, and now you're afraid, the Lord says to him, Peter, do you love me? Simple question. Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. Right? He's, he's, wanting, he's wanting to at least be able to say he loves him. may not be able to accomplish a whole lot of righteousness. may not be able to accomplish any you know, staying true and faithful. But Lord, I do love you. Is that possible for someone to be in that scenario? It is. Still, still afraid about how this change will happen. Still afraid about, could, I, could, it, could it ever be me? And yet, suddenly now, Peter, more than anything else, loves his Lord in a way that he never did before. And more than anything, it says in the Acts of the Apostles book, uh, it says that more than anything, they long to never again misrepresent their God. That's a tall order. Never again misrepresent their God. That's what they wanted, though. That's what they were longing for. We usually use the word perfection for that, but here's the trick. Where did Peter need to live on this chart in order to have what we're talking about? It's a trick question because all of these are words you don't want anything to do with, <clears throat> except that one over there. But where the trick is Satan wants us to think that we need to work on it, work on it. I, I remember being in an academy. I think I told this story a little bit last year, but... I was in academy, and I was a teenager, and as a freshman, you know, I was doing pretty good. I was only breaking one law out of the ten. Had, had nine, you know, going. I just needed one, needed some work on, right? So I figured, you know, that's what academy is for. We're going to learn to be spiritual and, and get religious, and we're going to learn, learn the thing, and we're going to get this fixed, right? That's what I was hoping. My big dilemma came that when I was beginning my senior year, I was now aware that I was breaking more than one. I thought at least three by now. And it wasn't getting easier. And it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. And it was getting more complicated. And the more that I wanted to be spiritual and wanted to be righteous, it seemed the more mess I was in. We had a week of prayers, you know. Every quarter we had a week of prayer. Uh, so that's like three every year. So in four years, that's 12. And, and I was that kid in the academy who didn't want to go get in trouble. I had no interest in that. Didn't want to go do what they were doing. And, and I was also, to be honest with you, the kid that was saying, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like them. <laughs> I didn't know that was bad, but it's terrible. And, and so as I'm a senior now, I was, really, I was really struggling with how in the world is this ever going to get fixed? See, because I didn't know the story about Peter very well, even though I got A's in Bible class. And didn't go to all those other whatever the kids were doing, party things. I didn't understand the story of Peter. I didn't understand the story of Moses very well. I mean, I knew the details, but it, it didn't occur to me that every single character in the Bible who ever was faithful to God went through this. Everyone. Whether you're talking about Jacob, or whether you're talking about Isaac, or whether you're talking about Abraham, 
Or whether you're jumping forward into more, more of the modern stories, right, with the King David. We read Psalms 51 a bit tonight. This is always our issue. It has always been our issue. Because we, we in the garden, our grandparents said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, maybe that's true that God didn't really say the right thing. And so we should trust who? Our wisdom to figure it out. It didn't occur to us then, right, to say, you know, I'm suddenly confused. Maybe I should ask God to help me out here. It didn't occur to us. We just said, well, yeah, let's try that out. And there goes the fruit. And then here comes Adam. And Adam's saying, well, wait a minute here. Now, this is a dilemma. I know we're not supposed to eat that. He, he knew the theory. He knew the, uh, the law, so to speak. But nonetheless, he chose his love of his wife and following her over his fidelity or his faithfulness to God. That's what got us into this. And you and I have all inherited that nature. We were born with it. It's our natural tendency to trust moi. Didn't know that when I was in academy. Later I learned if you broke one, you broke how many? Yeah, see, then I was wiped out on the floor. I'm like, <laughs> that, I'm in big trouble. I didn't know that. <laughs> so Moses, Peter, here's another one of my favorites. <clears throat> and feel free to throw any more into this mix if you'd like. But Mary, the woman that was thrown at Jesus' feet for, for adultery. Right? It says that that story should be told every time we tell the gospel, so we can't disinclude it. It's one of my favorite stories. But here, he, she hear, I, mean, I know you know the story, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the story. She hears those words, I don't condemn you. Great words. Especially for her heart, right? She was broken and beat up and outcast and treated like trash. And for her to hear Jesus say to her, I mean, can you imagine after the public humiliation? I don't condemn you. And then here it comes. But go and sin no more. He, he actually said that? Sin no more. Did Jesus actually believe that she was going to run home and never sin again? No. They're saying no for the video. <laughs> Did God, what, what, sorry? Say one more time. It would be on her mind. The words, right? It'd be, oh, how do I do that? But Jesus also knew that in his power, she could stop sinning forever. Isn't that true? So he just now needs to work with her to help her come from the first problem to the conclusion. So he says to her, go and sin no more. She runs home. And if you can just imagine a little bit into the story, she sincerely wants to stop. She sincerely has no intention of doing it anymore, just like Peter probably. But once again, fear and doubt comes into her mind and to her life because may maybe she didn't really see what she saw. She'd never seen that before. A man who, who was so kind and so gracious and forgave everything she'd ever done, just like that. All she'd ever seen is critical, condemning, judgmental. So fear, doubt maybe overwhelmed her, and suddenly she's falling back into her sinful life. But she says, you know what? <clears throat> I must go back and see. Did I see what I thought I saw? This time she comes to Jesus not because she's thrown there, not, not because they make her go there, but she wants to go for herself and see, did I see what I think I saw? I, I'm taking a little bit of liberty into the story here. But you know, it says that she had seven demons cast out of her. So I'm drawing upon Desire of Ages a little bit to help me put together the pieces. What did that look like? Because there's no story about her foaming at the mouth, right? There's no story about her like the demoniacs we know in another story. What was the demons that were controlling her? Fear? doubt, self-guilt, right? Fear that she can never be good enough. All those things she had been trained in her religious upbringing. So she goes back, and sure enough, she sees in Jesus' eyes, I know this part's true, <laughs> because he doesn't change, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And she saw in his eyes the same loving, forgiving, compassionate love of God, and she said, it was true. I will go home, and I will stop sinning. But she still hadn't learned yet the same thing Peter and Moses and you and I need to learn. I love in Steps to Christ where it says, we have this idea that we must do some part of the work. And every such effort, anybody know how that finishes? Must fail. Not might fail. Must fail. Why must? 
how else would we know that? I mean, it's a crazy trick because I find that suddenly I'm, I'm trusting in myself. I didn't even want to. I didn't even know I was. But God is helping me see. You see, there I go. You're falling apart again. That's because you're trusting yourself again. Lord, I don't even know how I'm doing that. Can you help me? And this is where David, right? He says, purge me with, okay? Open up my heart. Reveal to me where is my self-dependent. Where is my sin? Where is my not depending on God? God can do that. But he doesn't force himself into our heart. Behold, I stand at the door. If you, if, you, if you open the door, I will come in and what? Yeah, often what happens at the dinner table? We discuss how the day went. We discuss what happened. And was it good? Was it not good? And he's able to open up to it. That's what he means, eat with us, sup with us, to have meal, to have intimacy, to have uh, the working of, of his hands on our heartstrings to bring about a cleansing of the heart and a transformation of the heart. Do we not want that? So when we grasp this idea that he's actually working to help me figure out I'm still depending on myself, it's not so that I stay in that hole. It's not so I go, oh, I can't believe there again. I'm just, I'm never going to get out of this hole. That's not what it's for. It's to say, no, stop trusting yourself again. Learn to trust me more. I, I can lift you up and you can walk on water. I, I can keep you from denying me. God working in the heart can transform and change. The way to perfection is not to work on Pharaoh's program going to the left for you, <laughs> but rather letting the Holy Spirit bring us down where we see that, you know what? <clears throat> I am not better, Lord, than all those other people. Instead, we beat our chest and say, Lord, I, I am a sinful man. I have sinned against thee, as David said. But we grab a hold of what David was saying in Psalm 51. But you, O Lord, have mercy based on what? My repentance? Based on my submitting? Based on my repenting? No, because that's how God is. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. That, that's the, one of the most important verses in that whole psalm. And based on that, the rest builds. And so, so David can say, I'm in trouble. My heart is not right. My heart is in rebellion. My heart wants to gossip about people. My heart wants to talk evil and think evil of other people. I want to get on the internet and throw hurls at somebody. right? That, that's just how our hearts are. But when the Lord moves in, what happens to all that stuff? Destroys it. Goes away. And pretty soon... He can implant in your heart, in, in my heart, the ability to love the unlovely, to love those who hate us and persecute us and may speak all manner of evil against us. Not that we're speaking evil against them, but we stop that, and now it's okay with us if they speak evil against us, we will love them anyway. We will turn the other cheek again. This is called the miracle power of righteousness, the mystery of righteousness implanted in the heart and growing like... Uh, a crop of some sort, like a corn plant or a, or a fig tree that has figs on it, right? Again, thinking of Pharaoh, if at first you don't succeed, keep trying. Work at it harder, right? You'll do better. Here, here's what Uriah Smith, you guys know who Uriah Smith was? In 1888, Uriah Smith argued against this idea that I'm drawing on the board here. And he said, to say that my attempts at law keeping is like filthy rags is not right to say. I paraphrased that last part. <laughs> he didn't, didn't like that. He didn't like the idea. Now, this was the secretary of the GC at the time. He didn't like the idea that somebody was suggesting that his attempts at law keeping weren't good enough. So he wrote an article, <clears throat> which Ellen White comments on uh, in a letter to him, which we won't worry about the details of that time. I'm just going to tell you what's in this article. Right in the middle of this article in the Review and Herald, uh, that year, he said, the only, this is Uriah Smith again, the only way to attain to righteousness is through the practicing of the law. Now, that may be not so shocking to us because we've heard these ideas for a while now. <clears throat> My question is, how long do we have to hear these ideas before we say, Lord, you know, enough's enough. I don't want to trust in myself ever again. 
I don't want to misrepresent you ever again. Please do that miracle working power in me so that all the evil that is in my heart that comes out stops, destroyed, and we're transformed into his likeness. I was sharing last night <clears throat> with a small group meeting that we had that we just l listened to a fellow talk to us about Islam. A any Muslims in here? Okay. It would be nice if there were. Um, but, you know, how the media has got us all worked up. My mom last year was having a panic about this. She was just sure that, you know, any minute now the, the Muslims were going to take over and we're going to have Sharia law and all you women are going to have to cover up completely. Right? So what? So what if it did? Are we ready? Are we ready to live under the rule of Caesar or... Nebuchadnezzar or Darius, I'm just listing off a few of the in history evil kings, right? Uh, and submit to them in every way that we can as long as they don't what? Command us to disobey God. That's what Daniel did. I mean, if you ever thought about that, I mean, that's an amazing thing. Daniel living in that environment. He, he's captured and hauled off at a very young age, 14 to 16, some say. Uh, they're made eunuchs, thrown into the king's court, don't have much choice about things, right? And here goes the story of Daniel for his whole career. He is going to serve wicked, evil kings. I mean, our, our tendency is, I will not do what he says, right? We talk about Sabbath and, and the idea of Sunday law. We're not going to go into that tonight, but, but I just wanted to share this one idea because we, we suffer from this idea too much. Um, I was sharing this idea about submitting to all the powers and authorities as long as they don't tell us to disobey God. And we were talking about what happens if they were to make such a law. And they said, well, <clears throat> no more working on Sunday. What would you do? And I have, have Adventist friends who tell me, well, I, I'm going to mow my lawn. I'm, I'm going to work in my gut. I'm not bowing down to that idol. Is that a right response? See, that's that little horn thing now in us. We're so worried about it over there, but now it's in us. Is there anything wrong with not working on Sunday? No. How about if they say you need to worship God on Sunday? Any problem with that? No, technically not. In fact, if you, if you want to check me on that, just take a look in the book of Acts of the Apostles and tell me how many days of the week were they breaking bread from house to house, uh, opening up the scriptures, and preaching the word? Every day? Is that legal? But when they tell, if they were to tell me, if Nebuchadnezzar were to tell me, now you must work on God's holy Sabbath day, what's the answer? Respectfully, because God made you king, even if that means you have to take off my head, I must not, because my God has commanded me otherwise. But can we do it with grace? Can we do it with peace? Can we do it with love in our hearts for the very one who might now take off our head? The other idea is a total deception. The idea that we will fight against them. The idea that we will raise up and we will show them how it is. Right? Because this is about the Jesus who came to the planet to destroy all the false ideas and lift up all the truths about God, about his spirit, about his law, which is a transcript of his character. Anyway, so we got Moses, we got Mary. I mean, it's an amazing thing to me. I didn't finish the one about Mary. Let me just say, after we see Mary, whatever happened with these seven casting outs, after that in Scripture, if you just look and you find where she is in the story, she's always in the same place. Where is it? At the feet of Jesus. She learned. That's the only safe place to be, as did Peter as did Saul, who became Paul, as did Moses. I love how Moses, every time, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, millions of people out there in the desert, and they start griping, and, and that's got to be loud, right? You get that many people, and they're griping. It, it's not like you can just sort of tune it out. What does Moses do every time they start doing that? Falls on his face, silent, doesn't say a word. I'm thinking that's an that's a interesting battle strategy, evangelism strategy, 
What kind of evangelism strategy is that? You're supposed to be converting all these people. You're just laying on his face. Waiting for God to do something. He put his trust in God who was able to open the Red Sea. Put his, put his trust in God who was able to bring plagues when needed. Right? Put his trust in God who only could save them. And tomorrow we're going to spend focused time on that character of God. His love, his forgiveness, his healing, even his wrath. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk more about just the whole system of his government in judgment and how it works, the good news about how judgment works. But tonight, just wanted to have it sort of opened in your minds to say, yeah, your invitation that God has given us, like he did to all these characters we talk about, is to say, Lord, I, I, I need you to teach me to stop trusting myself. To stop reading the list as if somehow by reading the list I can get one more checked off. Right? That's what Pharisees do. That's what I was trained to do. We read the list and, okay, I got, I got nine of them. I just got one more to go. That was called deluded. <laughs> Here's why. This one I'm going to read. <clears throat> um, from Steps to Christ, and it's not unfamiliar. I try to use material that's, you know, very familiar to everybody so we're not just coming up with weird things. But... Um, here it is. Of course, I've got to get to the right one. Yeah, it's all good. One more. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <clears throat> So, from Steps to Christ, page 64, and uh, then we'll, we'll talk about how this is also actually in Scripture. It's proven in Scripture. This is just a summary way to see this idea. It says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more what? The more faulty you appear in your own eyes. Again, look at our chart. I asked you in the beginning, here was the trick question, how do you see yourself? not picking on anybody, <laughs> but how do we see ourselves? How do we grade ourselves? How do we look at ourselves? This says the closer. So let me draw this here. So let's say this is Jesus, and this is you, and this is you, meaning this is you close, right? We do like these uh, dimensional lines here, and this is you far away. The closer you come to Christ, the more faulty you appear in your own eyes. Doesn't that seem confusing i don't mean when we read it i mean when it happens again for me in academy it looked like this i wanted to really get spiritual <clears throat> freshman year so week of prayer is coming i'm ready to go we're going to read we're going to pray we're going to study we're going to get serious and that would last for about two weeks and then all of a sudden it's all falling apart and so next quarter come week of prayer i, I would say okay that was i was fooling around enough fooling around let, let's get serious, right? And read, pray, study, read, pray, study, about two weeks. And now I'm feeling more guilty than I did the first time, right? So here's, here's what I envision happening now as I look back on the story. I was in academy, and I was a, a sinful human being needing a Savior. Didn't know that I needed a Savior more than all those other people I was pointing fingers at. But Jesus would draw near to me, and I would sense what? My need. I would sense my, my lack of righteousness. And that would make me a panic, right? Because now it's looking worse. So I'd try to fix it. Read, pray, study, read, pray, study, read, pray, study. And I'm looking better to myself now, which means what? I'm further away by definition. And Christ would draw near, and I would panic another quarter. Read, pray, study, read, pray, study. And I went around this circle. Now I look back, it's like, you know, he's coming after me, but I, I'm running away. When I thought I was trying to get spiritual, I was actually running away. How deceived is that? Because it says, the closer you come to Christ, right, that's over here, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision, I like this part, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast. I, I don't like that. My Sins will be seen, my imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Isn't that true when you look at him, we, like we talk about tonight, about him, when we start talking about him, I, I love it. 
it's overwhelming to my senses that amazing love and grace that he had for Peter and all these other people. And I love that he has that for me too. But, but then instantly, uh-oh, I'm not anything like that. I'm not that patient. I'm not that, right? That's what happens to us. That's what it means. Your vision will be clearer. This, and here, here comes the, the great part. This, the fact that you can see that, this is evidence that, the, that Satan's delusions have lost their power over you. Wow. Just the fact that I'm seeing that I need him more than I thought I did is evidence that the Holy Spirit is working, right? And that that power of Satan has lost its delusions over me, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. That's, that's, that's awesome. And in contrast to that, here's often what happens. Many are inquiring, when we talk about the subject of righteousness by faith, many are inquiring, how am I to make a surrender of myself to God? See if this sounds familiar. You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Anyone? Your promises, now this is, this is interesting, your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. What is that? I've never purchased a rope of sand. What, what is that? What? It just, <laughs> so, so you're trying to tie something up with it, and it doesn't hold it together very well, right? It just, poof, just falls apart. Your promises and, re that's me in academy. Lord, I, this time I'm serious, right? My promises and my resolutions were like ropes of sand. Two weeks. <laughs> you cannot control your thoughts or your impulses or your affections. Man, I don't, I don't have much power at all. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, or your affections. You remember Jesus said, the power of man is good for what? Nothing. Nothing. The knowledge of your broken promises and your forfeited pledges then weakens your confidence. That was happening to me every single quarter. Weakened my confidence in my own sincerity. I was starting to question by the time I was a senior year. Maybe I'm just never going to be serious enough. I might as well just quit. I told my mom, not going to church anymore. I did tell her that. <laughs> she said to me, I hate to tell on her, but she, she said to me, well, why not? And I said, well, <clears throat> it hasn't done anything for me. I'm still, in fact, I'm worse than I was before. It's not doing anything for me. And I, I'm not sure it's doing anything for you and dad either. And I didn't mean that in, in an unkind way at all. I was honestly questioning, how come it's not like in the book of Acts? How come it's not like with Peter, James, and John? Because I didn't understand this, right? Because when I started to learn, actually, is... Anyway, I won't go into detail. Because <laughs> it says next, after the semicolon, but you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. And this is where some will say to me, see, you've got to choose to do what's right and do it. And we work hard at that. And we keep failing, but we don't read this, which it says all such efforts must fail. Because listen to where it goes. Everything depends on the right action of the will, the power of choice God has given to you. It is yours to exercise. And we, again, we like to stop right there and say, yeah, see? It's called uh, spiritual fitness. Hmm? But this goes on to say, you cannot change your heart. Oh, I'm back in trouble again. You cannot, of yourself, give to God the affections of your heart. I'm in real trouble. But you can choose to serve him. Now, at that point, I'm confused. Wait a minute. You just told me I can't do any of it, but I can choose to serve him. How am I going to serve him when I can't even control my affections, my thoughts? Read on. <laughs> you can give him your will. At that point, I'm a little confused. He will then work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature, this is amazing to me, thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Wow, because when I was in control, it didn't give me a very good scorecard. You can't control your thoughts, your affections, right? You can't change your heart. You can't not give to God the affections of your heart. But now, 
the whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. That's what we want, is it not? School of Pharaoh. Very tricky. Uh, I called it in the title there, Foundation of Babylon. The foundation of Babylon was simply this, and we'll work this some more tomorrow late afternoon. Nebuchadnezzar stood on his balcony, so to speak, and said what? Look at what I am doing. Look at what I have accomplished. I have worked my way up this ladder. I'm at least here or here or somewhere up here, right? But, but what Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn, and he got that lesson with the whole eating the grass for seven years or whatever he ate, he had no power at all. And when he came out of that, what did he say? The Lord God, he is God, not me. This is what we need. This is the invitation God gives in his love and in his grace and in his, all of his mercies. It is the invitation to come and be transformed. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We thank you that you are patient with us because we're still just almost as slow, if not more, than Peter, James, and John. And yet the lessons that you've given us there do help us, but now we want to go past the theory and we want you to actually have our hearts. Show us in our hearts, open our hearts that we, you can show us what is it we're still holding on to as an idol, something that we're depending on that isn't you, something we're trusting in that isn't you. And at the deepest part of that, how much we're trusting self because you can do miracles. You can bring us to walk on water. You can bring out of us a clean thing from an unclean. You can bring out of us your righteousness. We need this. We, we need to acknowledge, Lord, that we have been more sinful than we wanted to admit. And as a people, we need to come to you and say, Lord, this finishing of this work, this doing of your work on the earth, it is not going to be possible for us to do based on our track record thus far. So take our hearts, light it up with your flame, with your fire, with your spirit, that, that you might live through us, put in us the desire to love those who are unlovely, those who are hateful and, and sinful like we have been, so that we might be patient and kind and gracious with them and bring them into the knowledge of your goodness and grace. Be with us as we go home tonight that we'll um, be safe and that we can come back together again tomorrow and, and go further in our, our look into your character in Jesus' name. Oh.